Tonight from Wuhan, back on Canadian soil. I'm feeling so excited, so relieved. Evacuees airlifted from the infected zone now enter quarantine. Why one man who isn't sick has decided to join them. If you do not leave, you will be arrested. Pipeline standoff. After police moved in, protesters turned the tables. Worried about the flu? I always thought that I have a pretty good immune system. How the year you were born can help determine whether you get sick. The Canadian who made life in the trenches realistic and an Oscar frontrunner. This is The National. After weeks trapped at the epicenter of the coronavirus outbreak, as infections and fear in China spiraled, dozens of Canadians and their family members are now here thanks to a government-arranged airlift. A charter flight out of Wuhan arrived with 176 passengers, including both Canadian citizens and some permanent residents. They joined 39 more brought on a U.S. flight, their temporary home now, the Canadian Forces Base in Trenton, Ontario. Ellen Morrow has stories of relief and a reunion as they face quarantine on Canadian soil. For Richard Fabic, fear and uncertainty can now be packed away. I'm feeling so excited, so relieved. No wonder his 15-month-old daughter, Chloe, among the evacuees. Fabic is now voluntarily joining the quarantine to be with her. I'll follow proper sanitary process, wear a mask and, and wash my hands. But really, at the end of the day, I'm, I'm just looking forward to spending time with my daughter. And so he hit the road to Trenton. On the way to the base, passengers were screened multiple times for the coronavirus. So far, no sign of it. And so more than 200 evacuees are now settling into life on the base. Uh, so it's a, a, a hotel uh, on, uh, on the base here and it's got everything we need. Megan Millward arrived with her husband and two young children. We're not that worried. Uh, we've got We've got internet, we've got television, coloring books, um, space in the room to do yoga or whatever. They also got a sweet welcome, a local grocery store sending baked goods to the base. Store owner John Smiley is an honorary colonel there. We know what a tremendous sense of relief it is to finally arrive on Canadian soil after the, the weeks of tension I'm sure they've been under. We're, we're just glad they're home. At least one step closer anyway. And for Fabic, one step closer to daughter Chloe. Oh, when I get to hold her, I know it'll be real. And I, I just can't wait for that. And off he went, the final minutes of his long wait. Now, when Fabic got inside the base, Ian, Chloe was actually asleep. So his wait to embrace his daughter did go on uh, for a little while longer. Now, we did learn more about the quarantine itself today. Initially, officials indicated that the evacuees would be isolated from each other as much as possible while on the base. It appears it may actually be slightly more relaxed than that. I spoke to a source at Health Canada tonight. They said the evacuees will be able to interact with one another, but they're being advised that it's very important that they stay at least two meters apart at all times. The guideline is to stay in the rooms as much as possible and their meals will be delivered directly to their doors. Thanks Ellen. Ellen Morrow at CFB Trenton tonight. More than 700 people have been killed by this virus, more than 30,000 infected. According to the World Health Organization, this outbreak still posing a high risk worldwide. Cases can be found in 25 countries, but 99% of the world's cases are in mainland China. The second worst outbreak outside that country, with 64 reported infections, isn't even in a country at all. WHO calls it an international conveyance. The cruise ship Diamond Princess at port in Japan. In the space of 24 hours, confirmed cases on that ship tripled. Out of the 251 Canadians who are on board, there are now seven infected with this novel coronavirus. Chris Brown has the latest on the outbreak, quarantined in the waters off the city of Yokohama. 
The Diamond Princess now has the dubious distinction of being the most concentrated outbreak of the coronavirus anywhere in the world. It's scary. And passengers such as Canadian Trudy Clement wonder how long those like her who aren't sick will be able to avoid getting the virus. We'd all like to get home. If we're going to get this disease, we'd like to <laughs> be home to have it, isolation or not, but not here. It's, it's not a good situation. Ironically, it seems the only way to get off the ship before the quarantine end date of February 19th is to actually contract the coronavirus and receive treatment. No matter how happy Princess Cruises tries to keep everyone on board, there's no escaping. It's a disastrous scenario for the entire cruise industry, with ships in Japan and Hong Kong dealing with quarantines and passengers being pulled off ships elsewhere as a precaution. Shortly after, four people were taken off a vessel in New Jersey. Royal Caribbean and Norwegian cruise lines announced anyone with passports from China, Macau or Hong Kong is now banned from getting on board. Well, of course, this is an extraordinary step by Royal Caribbean. Uh, the, 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 we've never seen something like this before. Business prof Marvin Ryder says it's clearly not fair to label 1.4 billion people who are Chinese as possible carriers, but the tourism industry is panicking. In the Asia market, not the China market, the Asia market is down 80%, 80 percent, 80 percent. Again, not surprising given everything else you're hearing, but the big question is how fast will that bounce back? Well, those on the Diamond Princess, at least passengers who are lucky enough to have balconies or windows to look out of, are going to get a little bit of a respite from life in the port today. Their ship has to sail just a little bit offshore to do some regular maintenance with its ballast tanks and bilges, so that's what they're going to be doing today. And Ian, we saw the ship uh, sail out just a short time ago. And Chris, how are the Japanese officials handling the, the risk of the virus spreading? Well, we've already seen since this vessel arrived several others, uh, particularly others carrying people from China and Hong Kong, uh, have been turned away. And that's because authorities here are understandably very concerned about the spread of the disease. The Olympics, of course, the Summer Olympics are going to be here in just six months. And what they really don't want to have to contend with is what might just be the beginning of what they're seeing in Hong Kong. And that's localized outbreaks where the coronavirus might be spreading between people who've never been to Wuhan or China. All right, Chris, thank you. Chris Brown in uh, Yokohama tonight. China is racing to contain both the outbreak and criticism of its response. Weeks ago, one doctor tried to sound the early alarm about the virus and was quickly silenced, and now he's dead. As Thomas Dagler shows us, Beijing is facing a new outbreak of public outrage. In a country where dissent is rarely tolerated, consider this... Bold. Blowing whistles to remember a whistleblower. Dr. Li Wenliang worked and died at this Wuhan hospital, a victim of the virus he dared to warn about before the government would. Now, across China, even in Hong Kong, Dr. Li is being honored by many with pent-up anger over Beijing's early inaction. He's willing to speak up the truth. The truth was not spread around early. In a group chat in late December, Dr. Li warned of a SARS-like virus seen at the hospital. Chinese authorities were then still downplaying the new coronavirus, so police found the doctor and made him sign a letter admitting to spreading rumors online. His father now making this emotional plea. He was not spreading rumors. The virus was out there. I hope the government will withdraw the reprimand. What my son said is now proven to be true. On social media, Chinese users posting tributes to Dr. Li and unleashing what seems to be unparalleled online anger at the government. But for it to reach this scale, where almost every account, almost every person in China is posting about this, that's really unprecedented. They are allowing messages um, about the doctor to circulate. At Ryerson University's social media lab, Philip Mai is watching as Chinese internet censors struggle to contain the anger. But they haven't fully lost their grip. There's a lot of expectation in the West that this could uh, bring about a regime change, and I think that's uh, a lot of wishful thinking. Unverified video appears to show whistles in Wuhan growing louder, but there's no guarantee the government is listening.
Thomas Dagle, CBC News, Toronto. Here in Canada, this government faces hard choices and incredible pressures all related to the energy file. The Liberal ca cabinet has until month's end to say if a proposed $20 billion oil sands mine can proceed. Jobs are on the line and so is the promise to control carbon emissions. On top of that, the government's now on the hook for dramatically higher costs for its Trans Mountain Pipeline expansion. Vashi Capellos, the host of Power and Politics, shows how two mega projects are causing big headaches. The cost to build the Trans Mountain Pipeline didn't just go up a bit today, it went up a lot. The expansion project is uh, quite different than it was a few years ago. Construction of TMX will now cost Canadian taxpayers $12.6 billion, nearly twice the original estimate due to delays and accommodating Indigenous and environmental concerns. It never had to be this way. It's ridiculous. Not a single tax dollar should have been spent on the Trans Mountain expansion. A federal government that is attempting to be a climate leader should not be splurging all of this money, taxpayers' money, on this pipeline. But while the feds aren't thrilled to swallow the cost, they're not downplaying it either. Government sources hope coughing up cash convinces Alberta Ottawa is taking concerns about national unity seriously. So we stepped in because we knew that we needed to, to have the backs of those Albertan workers. But Alberta's premier appears to have a new litmus test for the federal government's commitment to the province. This is exactly why we need approval of the tech frontier mine. Cabinet has until the end of the month to decide on the $20 billion tech frontier mine in northern Alberta. It's passed all regulatory hurdles, but the political ones will be tougher. Liberals are openly voicing their opposition to the project. We look at the carbon emissions that would be coming from it. It just it doesn't seem to fit with transitioning to a low carbon economy and meeting net zero by 2050. The tech mine decision will make paying for TMX look relatively easy. If the Liberals decide to approve the mine, they risk alienating so many people who voted for them and for stronger action on climate change. They also risk alienating members of their own caucus itself. On the other hand, if they don't approve the mine, they risk creating a national unity crisis of sorts. At the end of the day, a great political cause no matter what. Vashi Capellos, CBC News, Ottawa. Alberta lost nearly 19,000 jobs last month. That's according to new employment numbers released today. In the heart of the oil sands, Rafi Buja Canyon shows us the hunger for new investment. This sprawling community centre shows how people's lives here are tied to big oil. Each section named for an industry giant. Economy-wise, anyway, it'd be great. Around here, people welcome the prospect of a new oil sands mine. A lot of jobs will be opening up. But relying on the Trudeau government to approve it raises suspicion. I believe that the Canadian government is ignoring Alberta in general. They think that uh, we're a dirty province and we're not worth it. Frontier Mine would be developed about 110 kilometers north of Fort McMurray. So remote, you can't see the site unless you fly over it. Tech says the mine would bring 7,000 construction jobs and 2,500 permanent jobs. We can use the investment on mega projects like this. For the Fort Mackay Metis, close to the proposed mine, it's an economic opportunity. They're one of the 14 indigenous communities that have signed agreements with Tech, counting on corporate money to fast track their own public works projects and provide good jobs. We want our people to get in there for the construction to be able to work their way up. I want my people to be engineers. I want them to be, you know, the operations managers. Energy and economy comes first. Indigenous rights come last. This activist says the deals Tech signed with Indigenous groups are just an attempt to buy public approval. They can't convince me. The reality is, is this is a project of massive uh, area that is going to be in the critical habitat for species that are in a serious risk. That's not what you hear back in Fort McMurray. We are uniquely blessed to have billion dollar corporations in our backyard. Let's get people working. Let's get jobs and opportunities out there. If federal liberals block the mine, cautious optimism will likely turn to anger. Rafi Bajikanian, CBC News, Fort McMurray. The Frontier Mines project isn't just top of mind for those involved, but for some premiers too. As Katie Simpson tells us, it might help explain a sudden shift in tone from Jason Kenney and Scott Moe towards the federal government. 
our esteemed guests this The premiers of Alberta and Saskatchewan came to Washington to develop new trade ties and arrived with a brand new attitude toward Ottawa. We have a much more constructive relationship now than we did before the election. And we've had the opportunity to open up a, a, a strong dialogue, I would say probably the strongest dialogue um, that we have had since uh, the, the Liberal government uh, came to power just over four years ago, and that's appreciated. This is a dramatic change for Jason Kenney and Scott Moe, two of the Prime Minister's most vocal critics, regularly attacking Justin Trudeau's energy policies. I think the appointment of, of Deputy Prime Minister Freeland with a clear mandate to address those concerns, those, those regional concerns about fairness in the Federation, is a very positive step forward. The Deputy Prime Minister was tasked with rebuilding trust in Alberta and Saskatchewan after the Liberals were shut out of both provinces in the 2019 election and has since travelled the country on a listening tour. I believe that Canada is at its best, particularly when we are working together on the international stage, when we are able to come together and represent Team Canada when we are able to identify areas of common interest, like NAFTA. Freeland worked with the premiers today, facilitating a high-level meeting with Donald Trump's top man on trade. But all of this cooperation comes at a time when those premiers have a significant ask. They want Ottawa to approve that new tech frontier oil sands mine. It's hard to overstate uh, the response uh, of Albertans, not, not just our government, but Albertans broadly, if, if this project were uh, to be rejected. Cabinet discussions on the mine are said to be difficult. Premiers Kenny and Moe made it crystal clear this newfound harmony would quickly disappear if the mine decision doesn't go their way. Katie Simpson, CBC News, Washington. And while in Washington, Jason Kenney said his former federal cabinet colleague, John Baird, is seriously considering a run for the conservative leadership. And Kenny is all for it. John uh, is very experienced. Uh, he uh, is a principled conservative. Uh, he is bilingual. Uh, and I think he'd be a very compelling candidate. Conservative sources say there is a behind-the-scenes push to convince Baird to enter the race. While coronavirus makes headlines, we're also in the height of flu season here in Canada. Tonight, new research that could help the fight against the deadly disease. Your first exposure conditions your immunity uh, for life. Coming up, why the year you were born can help doctors assess your risk. The Me Too movement encouraged people to speak out, but now many are finding roadblocks instead of resources. And the Canadian who brought the First World War to life. The Vancouver set designer who could go home with an Oscar this weekend. We're back in two. The conflict over a natural gas pipeline in northern British Columbia intensified today. Indigenous protesters have built camps to block the pipeline from going through Wet'suwet'en territory. But as Greg Rasmussen explains, an RCMP operation to dismantle them turned into a standoff. Good afternoon. How are you doing today? I'm fine. Good. My name is Jason Charney. Good far enough. This dramatic confrontation unfolded on a logging road on the disputed land. Do you understand that if you do not leave, you will be arrested. I thought you took cultural classes to understand. So, okay. Right now, you're breaching the injunction. Right now, we're having okay. a misunderstanding then. Police left, but tensions rose as people wondered what would happen next. Up this road is where police have been arresting people. This afternoon, though, those opposed to the pipeline blocked it with about a dozen vehicles. That means police remain on the other side. There is nothing you can say to make us stand down. Media aren't being allowed in, but this scene was filmed by those who call themselves land defenders. The only thing that I fear is that the world will continue to let this happen. Yesterday, six people were arrested at the first of three camps set up by the Wet'suwet'en along the road. Now released, this woman says she locked herself in this pickup truck until police smashed the window. I went down here, they grabbed my legs, they pulled me out, they had me down on the snow handcuffed on my stomach. So I had four officers holding my arms and I grabbed my arms and I held them up 
with the strength of our ancestors. Elected leaders from 20 First Nations along the route have signed agreements, but the Wet'suwet'en hereditary chiefs insist they have rights over the area. A BC court ruled in December they must not obstruct the pipeline. I think the humanity within the RCMP, the province of British Columbia and Canada itself, is gone. I think the democracy of Canada is being threatened because they're being listened, they're listening to a, a corporation. Coastal GasLink says it worked hard for a negotiated settlement, but the company says work needs to resume to meet construction deadlines. Is anyone here willing to speak with me? Late this afternoon, police made another attempt to exit. Have a good day. But were met by a wall of silence. Greg Rasmussen, CBC News, near Houston, B.C. Protests in support of the hereditary chiefs have popped up across the country. This was the scene at the main federal building in Edmonton. In Montreal, the cold and snow didn't stop this show of solidarity. And near Belleville, Ontario, Mohawk protesters parked heavy vehicles by the railway tracks, forcing the cancellation or delay of several via rail trains. We're watching several other stories tonight, including severe winter weather affecting millions on both sides of the border. Here at home, a fierce storm is bringing snow, freezing rain and powerful winds to much of eastern Canada. Schools have been closed, flights cancelled, and there were several major crashes across southern Quebec highways. Tens of thousands in the Maritimes lost power. The system is expected to continue into the weekend. That same system is causing chaos along the U.S. East Coast. In the north, hundreds of thousands were left in the dark as snow, intense rains and heavy winds hammer the region. Meanwhile, at least five deaths are being attributed to severe weather that destroyed homes and flooded communities in the south. And the city of Regina has cancelled Patrick Moore's appearance at a sustainability conference in May. The former Greenpeace director has called the climate change emergency a hoax. City officials say they'll still have to foot at least part of the $10,000 bill for his appearance. Still ahead, pictures you need to see to believe. Those are bats. They're invading an Australian town. Why authorities can't get rid of them. Plus. Okay, so you'll be calling first. How a map from McMaster University came to play a starring role in an Oscar-nominated movie. Next. The red carpet is ready. The stage is set for the 92nd Academy Awards on Sunday. For the second year in a row, there'll be no host, but rather a diverse list of celebrity presenters. Not so diverse, the list of nominees, with films like Joker, The Irishman, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, and 1917 up for the most awards. A lot of people are pointing out all four of those films are largely about white men by white men. Eli Glasner takes a look at how the Academy is still struggling with diversity. The billboard for this year's Oscars makes the statue look like a work in progress. An ironic choice, perhaps, because when it comes to the competition, critics say there's much work to be done. Among the 20 acting nominations is just one person of color. You can't hide your emotions. And after the success of films such as The Farewell, These are my co-workers. Jobs, please! Hustlers. No one makes their own way, least of all a woman. And Little Women, all the five Best Director nominees are male. Well, as a woman, as a Latina, yeah. you know, I'm disappointed, um, obviously. And I would like to see Jennifer Lopez in there as well. For you know, She was just as good as any of the other supporting actor nominees. Since Oscars So White started trending in 2015, the Academy has taken action. But after all those years and thousands of new members, people who vote are mostly white and mostly male. If you're a guy who's 35 and white, you're going to hire another guy that looks... Because you feel comfortable around people who look like you. That has your attention, doesn't it? And even for those new members, there are challenges. I'm in the Academy. It's very hard to vote. There's a, and it's expensive to be in the Academy. It's not a free thing to do. But this former Academy executive says the issue of diversity goes beyond the awards show. The problem if your issue is diversity, the issue is the movies aren't diverse enough, not the Academy is. Right. As far as the show goes, the Oscars is trying to compensate by inviting presenters that are certainly more diverse and female than the nominees. And while they won't be taking home any trophies, the audience has already voted with its dollars, making movies that reflect the changing face of America box office winners. Eli Glaster, CBC News, Los Angeles.
So as we mentioned, a front runner to take home lots of statues is 1917. It's being praised for the way it was shot and its realistic portrayal of life in the trenches. As Deanna Sumanag Johnson discovered, Canadians played a big role in making the film authentic. I'm going 1917 follows two British soldiers as they run through rat-infested trenches and bombed out towns of the Western Front. Their mission? prevent another division from walking into a deadly ambush by the Germans. If you don't, it will be a massacre. We will lose two battalions, 1,600 men, your brother among them. The filmmakers wanted a realistic war experience, down to this original British army map that lays out the young soldier's journey. It came from McMaster University's map library. Right now we have the largest World War I collection of maps and air photos in the world online. The rare map was reprinted and became a key element of the film's plot. So here we have the actual map used in the movie. Okay, so you be calling first. Tell me what we're looking <laughs> at here. There's a village mentioned in the film called A Coup, mm -hmm. which is the one that happens to be in flames. Uh, and then Croisille was the woods. But that map was not the only Canadian contribution to the film. Three, two, one, go! The man entrusted with creating the physical world of the film, production designer Dennis Gassner, is from Vancouver. To achieve the film's premise, that it's filmed in one continuous shot, Gassner built kilometers of trenches, towns and farms the characters can keep moving through. We had to measure it, we had to create it, we had to draw it, we had to model it, we had to build it and, and then we had to shoot it. Gassner found his inspiration at the Somme, one of the deadliest First World War battles for Canadians. And so all of a sudden, my DNA kind of <laughs> stepped up into, uh, into this realm of, uh, oh, I'm invested now, and I understand now why I had to do this film. Cop, very good. Now he's a favorite to win the Oscar for production design this weekend. For map librarian Gord Beck, the reward is just seeing the movie. I've been looking at these little red and blue squiggly lines on the maps for like 22 years now. So when you see a film like that, that was really uh, quite overwhelming. Canadian contributions, small and big, to the movie that brought the reality and horror of 1917 to move the audiences in 2020. Deanna Sumanak Johnson, CBC News, Hamilton, Ontario. Okay, now you're all ready to fill out your Oscar pool. Still ahead on the National. Locals are calling them bat tornadoes and they're bringing other creepy crawlies to town. Plus we explore new research that ties when you were born to how susceptible you are to the flu. We'll be right back. Harvey Weinstein headed back to court today. The once powerful studio boss is on trial for rape and sexual assault. Prosecutors have painted him as a predator who used his Hollywood clout to abuse women for decades. Today, his lawyers began his defense by trying to discredit a key prosecution witness. Weinstein has maintained any sexual encounters were consensual. The allegations against him gave rise to the Me Too movement and a public reckoning over the prevalence and impact of sexual violence. But that's put a huge strain on resources. And as Yuan or Miliotis explains, sometimes the consequences of that are tragic. It was like night and day. Before the assault, she was always bright, always happy, always smiling. There's a story behind every life and every death. Cassidy Coyles is a devastating one, and her mother refuses to bury it. After the rape, it was like a totally different person. You could see it wash over her face, that black cloud, and she'd go pale, and then she'd go to her room, and she'd stay there for hours and hours, just sleeping on her back with a blanket over her head. And this one of her laughing, it's my favorite. I like to look at it when I think about how sad she was. The darkness would smother Judy Coyle's youngest daughter. The 20-year-old was asleep at a house party in 2016 when she was raped. And she was so guilt-ridden that it just completely destroyed her. Four months later, she killed herself. It was her third attempt after the assault. 
Did she talk to you about how she was feeling, what she was thinking? Mm -hmm. She did a little bits of information, not too much. What would she say? Just that she felt so dirty and that nobody would ever want her now because she was a virgin and nobody would ever want her after this. Cassidy's despair speaks to the trauma of sexual violence and to the aftermath. And this is Cassidy swimming. She had connected with a local rape crisis center, only to be told she had to wait four months for regular counseling. Judy called to be sure. Did That's what they told me. That they just don't have the resources to act as quickly or... Did she talk about wanting help like that, that kind of help? Yeah, she did. What did she think about the fact that she had to wait that long? Just that nobody cared. Any case that results in the results that happen with Judy Coyle's daughter is absolutely tragic. This was a direct result of the perpetrator that committed that, that crime against her. You know, And to hear that the impact of that was a wait list is frustrating. Haley McDonald is the director of the Athena Sexual Assault Counseling and Advocacy Center. This is where Cassidy would have come to for counseling. She killed herself a few weeks before her first session. What does it say to you when that's the result? That's how, that's where her story ended yeah. while she was waiting. Yeah. And while she was waiting for what she knew to be at least four months yeah. for some counseling support. Yeah. I, it says to me that, that we still need to do more. It says to me that the Me Too era and, you know, hashtag Me Too is step one or, you know, step probably a thousand in, in this journey where we need to keep the conversation going. We need to, whatever barriers that were in place for Cassidy not to have service need to be addressed. Hi, Linda. Hi, Hi I'm Cassie. Duh. Welcome. Nice to, nice to meet you. Come on in. It's a harsh reality. In Canada, the Me Too movement has led to a flood of disclosures. Okay, you can have a seat there. Straining already exhausted resources. To offer something to people on the wait list, the Athena Centre recently introduced a six-week group class on trauma. It's a stopgap measure. We need societal outrage about violence against women because, yes, Me Too has, you know, certainly changed the conversation. We're still limited. You know, when society begins to say sexual violence is not acceptable and we are going to make every step we can, not just our agency, but everybody, to make sure women have access to specialized support services for sexual violence, then we will start to see a change and we will see a difference. It's our position that no one should ever have to wait for counseling. Nicole Peach is with Ontario's Coalition of Rape Crisis Centers. Her job is to advocate for more resources, now more than ever. The Me Too movement caused a shift in how survivors of sexual violence might have understood their own stories. So beyond that, we have seen an explosion in uh, crisis line calls and increased requests for counseling services at sexual assault centers. Ontario's new Conservative government invested a million dollars to reduce wait times. But it's one-time funding, and the money runs out in March. It's barely made a dent. More and more victims of sexual violence are reaching out for services. If we're living in a climate where that's the narrative, that it's important to speak up and tell your story, but when a survivor finally does that and they're not able to access support, it's a contradictory message. It also gives survivors the impression that their stories aren't important or that people don't believe or care. And that is the opposite of what ought to be communicated when someone finally discloses. Cassidy Coyle went to police the night she was assaulted. And in a rare move, her case proceeded to trial after her death. Last year, her attacker was convicted and sentenced to 18 months in prison. For her family, it was a hollow victory. They started an online petition calling for tougher sentences and more support for rape crisis centers. Why do you think it's so important that these centers get more support? They'd be saving lives. Because if they don't have support and the girls don't get counseling, their life's over one way or the other. And you think it would have made a difference for your daughter? Definitely. Why do you think that? Because she was such a bright, shining star, and she was always so happy, always singing badly, loudly, but she'd always uh, 
see the bright side and everything. So I know that the possibility of turning her around would probably be easier because she already was a happy kid. Losing her daughter, it's a cautionary tale. And Judy says she'll keep telling it so that no one else is left with what she has now, the empty promise of what could have been instead. Joanna Rumaliotis, CBC News, Midland, Ontario. The trial of Harvey Weinstein can be especially traumatic for anyone who's been the victim of sexual violence, bringing back memories of their own abuse. We talked to three survivors who are now counselors at the Toronto Rape Crisis Centre. My name is Deb Singh. I'm a survivor of rape, sexual assault, and intimate partner violence. My name is Erica Sabo. I'm a survivor of childhood sexual assault, of uh, sexual assault in my teens, of date rape. My name is Caitlin Chi. I'm a survivor of sexual violence and intimate partner violence. A trigger is a time where something external happens, like a smell or a sight or something you hear, and it sets something off in your brain that you remember your experience of violence. It's like you get transported back into a time that you're not in now. You're definitely not in your present self. It's something that makes you feel unsafe, in danger, and makes you relive the, the symptoms, the feelings. It'll go right to my stomach, so I'll often get st tummy aches or just like um, cramping. My heart rate will go up. Pressure in my chest, almost always in my chest. And just a, a feeling of unease that just washes over you, that you just can't shake. Think of whenever you're feeling fear, when you're, you're shocked or scared. It's something that just grips right away. And there's, a, there's definitely a fight or flight instinct that happens. And so there was one kind of recent time in the last couple of years or so where a survivor told their story and it very much mirrored my story. So I was no longer listening to the survivor and I was literally thinking about the last time I was assaulted. Sometimes I get triggered when I'm on social media and when strangers private message me saying, you know, things like, hey, how are you doing? Beautiful. Um, asking for a fun time, all of these things that just put me in a compromising situation. For hours, it can last for days. It, it really depends on what the trigger is, where you are, when it happens. So when there are public cases in the news about sexual violence or sexual assault court proceedings, uh, I mostly turn away from the details because those things aren't really that meaningful to me uh, as a survivor, as a human. Um, it's hard to be able to watch all that stuff and to take it in. I sometimes watch and sometimes don't. I find that because it is triggering for me. Uh, I try to step away to a certain extent, but I also want to learn more and I want to understand more and hear other people's stories. When I'm deciding whether to consume media about sexual violence or not to, uh, part of it is considering whether I'm going to be triggered, but um, a large part of it is also just not be needing to have too much um, exposure to it. So it can honestly be a large part of self-care for me. Most communities in Canada have a rape crisis center with a 24-hour hotline. If you or someone you know needs support, call Crisis Services Canada at that number on your screen. People are available around the clock. Next on The National, another tool for doctors in understanding and fighting the flu. Why the year you were born could affect how likely you are to get sick.
Welcome back. We're following several international stories this evening, including the latest in the investigation into the helicopter crash that killed Kobe Bryant, his daughter, and seven others. U.S. federal investigators say wreckage from the crash didn't show any evidence of engine failure. That reinforces the idea that weather played a factor. A public memorial to remember the victims of the crash has been scheduled for February the 24th. Two key witnesses who testified against Donald Trump in his impeachment trial were fired. The U.S. envoy to the European Union, Gordon Sondland, said in a statement that he was advised the president intends to recall him immediately from his post. Just hours earlier, Lieutenant Colonel Alexander Vindman, a top expert on Ukraine, was escorted from the White House. Check this out. Those are bats flying through the sky, often dropping spiders and mites on people below. Hundreds of thousands of them have overtaken the small Australian town of Ingham. The problem's so bad, the town council has tried to take up the cause, but they're having a problem because getting rid of fruit bats, well, they're a protected species. So for the better part of the next three weeks, loud sounds and high-intensity lights will be used, but here's the problem for residents. That's supposed to start at dawn and will last for an hour or two each day. With coronavirus grabbing headlines, we're not hearing much about influenza, but February is still peak flu season. And as Vicodopia tells us, new Canadian research shows when you were born could predict which strains your body can fight. You ready? This is only the third time Alta Eng is getting vaccinated. She doesn't remember ever getting the flu. I always thought that I have a pretty good immune system, uh, but I've seen how the flu has affected the neighborhood and my friends and family this season. Eng's luck could have something to do with the year she was born. The latest numbers show so far this flu season is not too different from the last and not as bad as two years ago. But they also show how some age groups are more likely to get sick than others. They might be more susceptible uh, during specific years if one type of virus is, is circulating. This demographer worked with infectious disease experts at McMaster University to track what's called antigenic imprinting. The idea that your exposure to different flu strains as a baby can build antibodies that make you resistant to the same strain in future years. Using flu data, their study found Canadians born during the deadly Hong Kong pandemic, which began during the late 60s, were more resistant to the flu strains of the past two seasons. As you will get other infections later in life, even if it's with different virus, um, you will most likely uh, boost your first antibody, the first antibodies that you met earlier in life. Knowing which age group will be vulnerable to the flu could be important for planning during epidemics. Our hospitals in Canada are typically above 100% capacity. This infectious disease specialist says the relationship between age and the flu is important, but there are multiple factors that influence who's most at risk. Their vaccination rate, uh, the population, how sort of immune is that population. The relative humidity in the room is actually a big player in terms of influenza transmission. and. So all of that stuff is, is playing into the epidemiology, which is why it's so hard for us to predict what's going on. As for Alta Eng, she's not taking any more chances. Vicodopia, CBC News, Toronto. Next on The National, who is the mystery person or people behind a town's brand new ice rink? I think it's amazing that someone's taking the initiative because we need people to be more active. Seeking the good neighbor in our moment. This pond might look like just any other outdoor skating rink, but there is a twist. No one knows who's been maintaining it all winter. Their identity unknown, but one thing is for sure, the Nova Scotia community is enjoying it. And the mystery behind the rink is our moment. This year I said, we're going to go skating at that pond. So it was amazing. Someone's gone in there and plowed it around. I was assuming it was the town of Wolfville, somebody from their rec department. It, whoever it is that's doing it knows the value in it and knows how much appreciated it would be by the public to use it. I think it's amazing that someone's taking the initiative because we need people to be more active and it's actually 300 meters. So it's just shy of a running outdoor track. So it was really nice. I could do loops and loops. There was a lot of people using it that day. There was some kids playing hockey and then there was little ones going and, you know, mom was pushing the little one in the stroller all the way around. And 
So it's nice to see like families are using it. Let's hope that that person that's been so great at uh, keeping it clear speaks up and takes, you know, takes some ownership and uh, gets recognized for what they're doing. So apparently word in town is there was a guy with a snowblower near that rink. His name is Daryl. And so maybe it's Daryl who's been doing all this work to make sure that rink looks as pristine as the ice did in those uh, pictures we saw. And you know, as small town rumors go, that's kind of a nice one as they try to figure out who's behind that. That is The National for this Friday, February the 7th. Good night.